Good evening and welcome to this talk by Dr. Nigel Woodcock, one of our fellows here at Clare. My name is Anne Cernak and I joined the college this February as a senior development officer. I'm really very pleased to be here tonight and I hope that I'll have the opportunity to meet many of you in person soon. Our session this evening is being recorded and the link to the recording will be made available on the Digital Gala Week website tomorrow. So please feel free to share that link with anyone you think might be interested in hearing the talk. We will have lots of time for questions. So please do also write your questions into the chat function on Zoom and Nigel will answer them after his talk. I'm delighted to introduce Nigel Woodcock, who is Emeritus Reader in Earth Sciences and was the Earth Sciences Director of Studies in Clare from 1987 to 2018. He is, however, more widely known in college and maybe to several of you as the president of the Clare Boat Club since 2000. Nigel's research has ranged widely across tectonic and sedimentary geology and in includes the standard textbook on the geological history of Britain and Ireland. It is only in retirement, however, that he's been able to fully indulge his interest in Cambridge building stone. Nigel, thank you so much for being here with us. Over to you. Thanks very much, Anne. So um, we thought you'd like to know more, a bit more about the, the stone that uh, Claire is built of. We take its architectural splendor uh, perhaps for granted if, we, if we've seen it a lot, but far fewer people think about what it's built of and why. So that's what I want to do. The title's slightly different to advertise, but I assure you that it, it covers the same ground because I want to put, uh, I want to um, branch outside Clare a little bit and look at the, the building stone history of Cambridge itself before Clare Old Court was built and see how uh, Clare fits into that and was it just following fashion or was it breaking fashion and to some extent innovative. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, I want to look first of all at Old Court, just a straight description of, of uh, what it's made of. Then I want to go backwards in time and look at the, the medieval to Tudor Old Court. There was an older Old Court, of course, um, now totally demolished, almost totally demolished. There are little bits of it underground. And uh, we'll, we'll try and work out what that was made of, but we'll find that we can't do that without uh, looking back at what uh, buildings of that age were, were made of in other parts of Cambridge. So we'll look at uh, Cambridge stone, first of all, before 1440, and then um, between 1440 and the, the start of the new old court. And then we'll come back and, and uh, look at the two old courts in the context of what we've learned by looking at the rest of Cambridge. So um, let's just straightforwardly describe the, the uh, uh, rock types uh, in, first of all, the walls. We're gonna look at the walls and the roof, uh, the roofs and the paving, and then uh, the boundary walls of college, which are particularly interesting, which you may not even have focused on. So the walls are all one stone. They're, they're a, a limestone, this lovely golden limestone from Ketton in uh, Rutland, the limestones of Jurassic age. And the stone makes up not just the, uh, the window surrounds and the door surrounds as, as often in buildings of this age, but also the, the, all the walls themselves. So the walls are smoothed stone, which we call ashlar. And then, the whole court was built uh, to a fairly um, uniform uh, design or style, or at least styles that blend very well together, but over quite a time range. So the East Range was built first with the Porter's Lodge in it, and then the South Range here, which uh, faces onto King's Lawn. And then we're working round clockwise uh, to the West Range, which, uh, which was, was next, but um, there was an unfortunate break due to a small matter of the Civil War, so that uh, when building started up again, uh, the, the Master's Lodge end of the West Range was started. It took, seemed to take a long time because they were also building the North Range. 
So it went round such that by uh, the end of the 1600s, the, the court was pretty much built. The chapel uh, is, is later, although it, again, it looks, uh, it, it blends in so well with the main old court because it's built in the same stone, but it's, it's uh, as much as 100 years late, later than some of, some of old court. So that's the, that's the walls. The, the, the roofs are also made of a Jurassic limestone. It's not, uh, we call this stuff slate or perhaps stone slate to distinguish it from true slates, which some of you may have on your, your houses, Welsh gray slate, which is a metamorphic rock. It's been subjected to high pressures and temperatures in the earth. This, this slate is just a sedimentary rock and it just happens to split very well along the horizontal uh, bedding planes along which the, um, uh, the rock was deposited uh, from bottom to top. So this is also Jurassic. It's actually in Northamptonshire, even though it's literally about a 10 minute bike ride from, from Ketton, I would, I would estimate, it's just on the other side of the Welland Valley. So they're very close together. Uh, this, uh, you may well know from um, from the story of uh, the building work that's been going on in the last couple of years that this roof in particular got in a very bad it's got in a very bad state. Um, some of it is still in this state, of course, in the South Range, and um, it's needed replacing so that now we have uh, a good chance for a before and after view of the same bit of roof here. This um, this this will last at least another hundred years. The hope is. These blue patches will gradually turn orange. They'll, they'll rust, if you like. This is just the iron minerals in the newly quarried rock, which haven't been exposed to the air for long. So that's the, that's the roof. And one of, one of the joys of Clare is that it has a roof which matches the, the walls in colour. It, it's subtle, but it, it, um, it makes, the, makes the building particularly coherent. And then there's the paving materials in Old Court, which are easy to ignore. Well, po possibly not, because you sometimes trip over them if you're not, uh, if you, if you uh, waver off the, uh, the flagstone paths, they're not the easiest to walk on, these, these cobbles. So it's made of a mixture of these flat flagstones, which are carboniferous, probably from Yorkshire, and relatively modern in, ter in the terms which we're talking about. They certainly were, wouldn't have been there in the 1600s. Uh, the, the cobbles are um, from local uh, quaternary deposits, old river gravels, and uh, we call them fieldstone because they were, uh, they were gathered off uh, ploughed fields as, as, uh, as fields were brought under the plough in the Middle Ages. These things got in the way and were chucked to the side and they uh, had a, a, a saleable value for uh, paving. And this stuff is still very much in evidence in Cambridge and college courts and elsewhere. And then I said, there's a fourth component of old court, which is most interesting because it's the oldest uh, component of the whole site. There, there's a boundary wall against Trinity Hall here uh, visible in North Passage, if you've ever been ventured into there to uh, uh, get pump poles or whatever else. Uh, and this is made of a white rock, uh, which is local chalk, Cretaceous age, from um, just to the east to southeast of, of Cambridge. Uh, I've called it clunch. Clunch is the name, is the quarryman's term for hard beds in the chalk, which are suitable for building. Most chalk is so soft that it would uh, weather away in, um, in just a few decades. This stuff at least lasts in a reasonable state for, for maybe up to a century. Uh, but this has done very well to last since, we think, uh, before 1350. I think this wall probably existed before Clare College existed. And uh, there's another one on the other side of, uh, of Clare. On, this is the King's Clare boundary wall. Again, the white material is clunch. Uh, both these walls have some Jurassic limestone in, 
which I've called ragstone. It's rather low quality, um, flaggy looking limestone. It's at the bottom here in the Trinity Hall wall and halfway up in the King's wall. Uh, this would weather better than the chalk and maybe that's why it was used. And each of these walls has, has a topping of brick, which is of some later age unspecified. So, and there is clunch elsewhere in college. Uh, there were some archeological investigations done in Old Court uh, reasonably recently. And um, they came across clunch in the foundations to what was part of the old Old Court, the pre 1600s Old Court. And we'll have something more to say about that. Indeed, let's move on to that and uh, see, see what we know about it. That foundation that I was just showing you probably came from actually underneath this building here. The got to reorient yourself or at least realign yourself because this view of the old, old court um, is, uh, is looking from uh, over the old schools, hovering over the old schools, looking westwards towards the river. Here's the river at the back. And the, uh, the front edge of, of the college here is actually Trinity Lane. The whole of the old college was moved sort of half a court towards Trinity Lane compared with the present, present old court. Uh, and so um, I should point out, this is, a, this is a, um, an image from 1740 drawn by an undergraduate called Prido, uh, presumably copied from a, a pre-1638 source, uh, which is, is lost. We don't have that, but we have to take this as, as um, somewhere near the truth. And actually the archeological investigations uh, to, to a limited extent did support this, this uh, image. So let me run you through the, briefly through the history of, of this old, old court. So Clare Hall, if you read, or Clare, as we now know it, was, uh, was had its origins in University Hall, 1326, which had two hostels, one just here, fronting onto Trinity Lane, and one just here. Uh, up against Kings, and those burnt down in 1334. There's a lot of burning down of buildings at this time because many of them may have been roofed in thatch, and so a mixture of thatch and um, wood fires was uh, was not was was not uh, designed to keep these buildings um, intact for long. Uh, Clare, Clare Hall, as it was then known, was fo founded in 1338 or refounded, uh, maybe using some of the original um, buildings, but uh, all we know is that this court was constructed in phases. We know that the chapel was built in here in, uh, uh, in the uh, mid to late 1300s. It's exactly where the present chapel is. So. Uh, the, when you've moved all this lot back by half a court, this sticking out bit is, is where the present chapel is, though present, though rebuilt, and it had a library built on, uh, on top of it. And then the, what we do know is that in 1521, the master's chambers, the master's lodge and the treasury, the bursary, if you like, which was here, the master's lodge was, relatively speaking, where it is now, on that bit of the on the Trinity Hall side of the West Range, that they burned down. There is a bit of a myth that Old Court had to be rebuilt as the new Old Court because of that fire. In fact, if you look at the timing, um, it's at least a century before the rebuilding of Old Court. And uh, we know in fact that that West Range and the, the North Range was re rebuilt soon after the fire. That was the rebuilding, uh, but we don't see anything of that now. And then uh, we know that by the early 1600s, the court was described as in disrepair. So the, the reason, one of the reasons why Old Court was rebuilt was that it was in, in a bit of a shambolic state. And I'll, I'll show you that there's probably, that was probably due to the rock type which it was built of. So 
we, we, we want to see if we can find out what old, old court was made of. And the second question is why, was, why build the new old court uh, further west? So let's deal with that last question first. It's quite easy to, to explain to you if you've not uh, heard this story. So here's a, an aerial view of the modern old court with the chapel sticking out here. And if we superimpose on that, the, the footprint of the, uh, of the old, old court fronting onto Trinity Lane here. And we put in King's College Chapel here, which uh, had been built rather inconsiderately by King's extremely close to the corner of Clare here. So that uh, there was a very narrow passage. It must have been, well, it's, it's less than the width of Trinity Lane here. You know how, how uh, narrow that is. So this was very unsatisfactory. And when rebuilding was, was uh, planned, it was perfectly logical to take it westwards so that there was a bigger gap between uh, us and King's Chapel. And there was another deal done, which was to first of all lease to kings and then sell to kings this parcel of land here uh, which uh, is why front court here doesn't come all the way uh, to form a perfect rectangle or form a rectangle up against the edge of uh, in line with the edge of the south range here we did a swap for the land which is now the fellows garden so it's a pretty good deal i guess so that was why it moved westwards but to work out what it was built of or get some reassurance, we, we, this is where we need to look at the use of, of stone in Cambridge uh, more generally. What, what was uh, pre-1440 um, uh, Cambridge building uh, being, what were these buildings being made of? Well, the first uh, resort, if you're building uh, in Cambridge is to look at, is to use local stone. The cost of stone is uh, very largely determined by how far you have to transport it. You only have to move stone about 10 miles over land and you've doubled the cost of the, the stone at the quarry gate. So the natural stone to use was this chalk, this clunch, which came from quarries uh, very locally really in the outskirts of Cambridge at Cherry Hinton or within the city boundary pretty much now. Uh, quarries still exist there. They're not quite the medieval quarries. They're just across the road, but they give you an impression of what they would look like. And um, in the Barrington region, this, this has been partly filled in now, was a, a big um, chalk pit for a cement works, but the stone came to, Cape, to Clare and to Cambridge in general from just over the hill from here. Um, in the older Barrington quarries. So that's, that's where it was coming from. And the other component I've mentioned is this field stone, which not only was used for paving, but was used for building walls. It's very difficult material to, to uh, build with, but with enough, with enough lime mortar, it was possible to make durable walls with it. So there are two local alternatives, but there were, it was necessary to bring in, if you like, I've called them more exotic materials from uh, as much as about 50 miles away. That's because if you try and build walls of this field stone, it's totally unsuitable for making the corners of buildings and for the more resistant bits like these string courses. So at some expense, you brought in uh, limestones, hard limestones, good for building from further away, in particular, this Barnack limestone from near Stamford, um, which is, uh, I think Stamford is in Lincolnshire. It's right at the boundary of four counties. So it's almost irrelevant which modern county it's in. Uh, it's just a few kilometers, uh, Barnack is just a few kilometers uh, um, east of the Ketton quarries. I'll show you a map in a minute. And the other, uh, the other component which was brought in was a, this lower quality limestone, which I've already mentioned, which I called ragstone or blockstone, uh, same difference. And here in this, um, this building now in St. John's College, the School of Pythagoras, you can see uh, both the local 
chalk, the clunch in the upper parts of the building, and this ragstone in the lower parts. But uh, the Barnack stone, as in this St Peter's Church, is forming the the really uh, the bits of the building which have to be really hard wearing, the buttresses and the coins, the cornerstones and so on, string courses. So those are the, the, the components that were being used almost in, in their entirety in, in pre-1440 buildings. Uh, here's the oldest surviving building intact in Cambridge, St Bennett's Church, which is uh, this ragstone, walls with Barnack uh, coins and, and string courses and even uh, window surrounds. Now here's where it came from. Here's, uh, here's a map of Eastern England here with coloured in the main stone belts in Eastern England. Here in green is the chalk with the quarries from which Cambridge stone uh, was sourced marked in blue. Here in yellow, are the mid Jurassic rocks, older rocks, which run up, well, they, they come up from the Cotswolds, that's the same, basically the same units. They run right up to the Humber here. And uh, the third belt, which I will mention later on, is this uh, even older belt of rocks from the Permian, which um, the parts of King's College Chapel are made from. That's, that's uh, you drive up this belt of, uh, uh, Permian limestones, if you take the A1, it more or less faithfully for, follows this high ground formed by this limestone belt. I've enlarged the, um, the Jurassic uh, belt here, which I might slip into calling the Lincolnshire limestone belt, that's the geologist term for, for these rocks, even though only part of it is in Lincolnshire. And you can see here's uh, Barnack just here, here's, here's the town of Stamford, and uh, I want to put on Ketton there. Uh, you can see how close together as a 10 kilometer scale, how close together these quarries are. Uh, I talked about the cost of moving stone, uh, this sort of distance. Uh, and I talked about the overland cost. Uh, here's the uh, Barnack quarries, by the way. These are now in a botanical nature reserve called the Hills and Holes. This is the the topography left by the medieval quarrying. And if you uh, go down the hill uh, to the southeast, you reach the River Neen, uh, just um, upstream of Peterborough at a, uh, a wharf site called Gunwade. And we know from documentary evidence that a lot of the Barnack stone uh, was uh, sledged downhill probably, or carted downhill to, to Gunway. That's a distance of 10 kilometers. It's quite a distance. But once you got there, you were, um, you were onto the river system. The old wharf, uh, as far as I can make out at uh, Gunway, is still there. It's dried up now, but it, it's just on one side of the, the river Neen. So there's good evidence on the ground for this, uh, for the Gunway, the Gunway wharf. And the stone would be loaded on to barges supposed to look something like this, which could be punted along these rivers and uh, brought across or, or around the fens. The, uh, here's the, here's a, a map of, of the fens. Cambridge is down here. Uh, the quarry belt is up here. Here is Peterborough and Gunwade Ferry. And there were two ways of doing this in the, um, uh, you, you could take the, uh, the simple route, or you'd think it was the simple route of, of going out down one of the, the rivers, the Glen, the, the Welland, the Neen, out into the Wash and back up uh, the River Ouse and then the Cam up to Cambridge. Um, that green line isn't as easy as it looks because there are lots of sandbanks in, in the Wash in present day and probably would have been in the Middle Ages. But the middle, the medieval coastline was further southeast. So um, this, this route varied with time, let's say. That's quite a long way, but fortunately uh, the, uh, there was a shortcut uh, kept open by the, um, by the monasteries and the, the Fenland abbeys to transport their stone and their goods. And that, that cut across to the to the ooze basically and then uh, um, up the camp and the cost of uh, inland trans waterway transport is about 
uh, five times less than the cost of overland transport. So, um, so this was a, not a prohibitively expensive operation. So back to the buildings themselves, because uh, there's undoubted evidence that Barnack Stone did arrive here. And just a summary of what I've been saying about these pre-1440 buildings, they were made of uh, rubble walls, if you like, of either uh, fieldstone or ragstone with Barnack um, dressings and, or maybe clunch windows, often that was used for windows, or they were, the walling was, was a clunch rubble, uh, rubble as in not very smoothed off. And um, uh, so we have these various possibilities for what the older old court might have looked like. Uh, there was building going on in Clare after 1440, and uh, there we have another possibility that uh, the big thing in about 14, the 1440s was the rediscovery of the skill of making brick. And the first extensive brick building in Cambridge is Queen's Old Court here, 1448 to 9, of red brick with uh, clunch and barback dressings to the windows, which still survive. Uh, and other early brick buildings are the old school's building here, which was um, uh, part, of, part of King's, basically, uh, originally. And a little bit later on, Jesus, uh, essentially a brick college with stone dressings. So here was an alternative to what some of uh, the old, old court might have look, looked like. I should mention, um, that uh, although the dressings in Queens are Barnack, the dressings in Jesus are stone from further south in the limestone belt called from Weldon. It's a much whiter looking stone. The reason for using this is that Barnack ran out in 1460. So you pretty much know that uh, the any Barnack was, was, was pre-1460. The Weldon stone, just taking a, a bit of it, has offered a bit of a tangent, but uh, a prominent tangent for a couple of minutes. Um, Weldon became a very um, prominent stone in, in, in Cambridge. Uh, it was used, for instance, for Great St. Mary's Church, the facing on Great St. Mary's, and it was used uh, most famously for the vaulting in King's College Chapel and for the upper external parts of King's College Chapel. If you look at our end, the Clare end of King's College Chapel, uh, you can see actually it's made of three different colored stones. Um, none of which are used in Clare, it has to be said. Uh, if I draw those lines on there, and I've enhanced the, the middle color here, I've slightly deepened the color uh, so that it shows up. And you can see rather clearly that the, the top is a light colored limestone. Uh, this is the Weldon. There's a, a more orangey limestone, which is from a quarry I haven't mentioned uh, called Clipsham, which is just north of Stamford. And then there's a white stone at the bottom here, which is this Permian limestone from Yorkshire, which, uh, which I showed you on the map. Well, there's a very interesting story of King's College Chapel, which is a whole lecture in itself. We won't get too diverted uh, into that, except just to note, that there was a building here going up right next door to Clare, which was made of ashlar. It wasn't rubble, it didn't have rubble walls like most churches in Cambridge uh, that had been built before. It had nice smooth stone walls, and that might have been one inspiration for what was to come in Clare. Uh, oh, this is just to show you where Clipsham is. Clipsham is in here. So we've, uh, and Weldon is right down here. So they're, they're not too far away. So a summary of, of um, the, the buildings which were going up in, in, uh, in Cambridge uh, whilst old, old court was, or the second, uh, during the second part of the period in which old, old court was being built, had um, uh, brick uh, or a transition from rubble walls to brick walls with, uh, with stone dressings for the windows and doors and so on. Of course, this was this was paralleling a change in architectural style from uh, 
the pointy Gothic windows and battlements uh, here of the old schools here through sort of transitional architecture to proper um, Tudor architecture with squared off windows and uh, no battlements and so on. So of course, architectural style is partly determining, is, is going in parallel with the change in building materials. So let's now, having learnt about the rest of Cambridge, let's, uh, let's turn to um, trying to understand what old, old court was built of. Uh, if we enlarge this drawing, you can make your own mind up, but to me, this doesn't look like brick. It's not brick. Uh, it looks like quite largest blocks of a light colored stone. And the windows look to be about the same color. So I think that the old, old court was made of clunch. It was made of, of uh, chalk, uh, probably without the bits of red brick, which we see in the back of Peter House here, which is one surviving example of this. And uh, so that's my guess. And looking at uh, some older uh, or some surviving uh, clunch walls, which haven't been so well maintained, you'll see that it, it's not difficult for it to get into a state of disrepair, which um, is, this was a 1545 wall on the, uh, the boundary of Trinity Hall with Garrett Hostel Lane. And I think so the simple explanation is that uh, the former old court was built of clunch and it, it uh, even 100 years after it was uh, after the last additions to it, it was in a bad state and simply needed uh, replacing and uh, other colleges face this problem too. Christ's, for instance, Pembroke had buildings built of clunch and they actually started, uh, they actually refaced them, uh, both of those in Ketton limestone. But for the reasons we've already discussed, it made um, sense to actually start, knock down the old, old court and start again uh, further back. Uh, so um, what were the roofs made of? Uh, I can't really tell. The, the, the drawing isn't really accurate enough to tell between the two possibilities. Uh, either Collie Western slates, which we stone slates, which we see now, or clay tiles would be another, another possibility. I like to think that it was, they were made of Collie Western because Clare, um, the new old court, is the last building in Cambridge uh, for, for some time to have been roofed in Collie Weston slate. And I think probably it was because there was a cheap supply of uh, reusable Collie Weston slates on the old, old court. I think that would be logical. The, the individual slates last quite a time. Um, they just need, need trimming and relaying and uh, they're good to go again for another hundred years. So some of the uh, some of the slates on the present roof may well date right back to um, the old, old court. Uh, we're on firmer ground with the, the, the paving in the old, old court because one of the excavations uh, done a few years ago actually revealed one of the old, uh, the old paths. And it was about here in the old, old court. And Wonderfully, it was of exactly the same mix of uh, cobbles that form the present uh, cobble, cobble paving in Old Court. So some of the old cobbles was, were reused. Why they didn't reuse it all, I'm not sure, but they left this bit down, which is very helpful to us. Um, and so here's the, here's the modern assemblage, here's the, the, uh, the medieval assemblage, and uh, geologically, I, we can tell from the mix of rock types in here that they're from exactly the same um, range of fields, if you like, outside Cambridge. Um, I'm pretty sure from looking at this stuff in buildings that uh, almost all fieldstone in Cambridge was brought in before the Black Death, about 1350. Um, for a simple reason, the, the supply dried up after the Black Death because population was hit hard, almost hard, some people say. And um, the present, the, the plowed fields existing at the time were plenty to supply 
uh, the d diminished population. There was no need to plow any more fields. So for, for some centuries, uh, um, it wasn't necessary to, to expand the agricultural um, land around Cambridge, by which time brick had, been, had come back into fashion. We didn't have any need for fieldstone. So let's just, that's the old, old court. Uh, let's turn to the new old court. Why, why did um, New Old Court not use brick? Brick was what had been used uh, right up until this point. Here are two buildings indeed, just predating Clare, uh, Pembroke and Queen's Courts, uh, which used Ketton for actually predating the Ketton in uh, Clare for the windows and doors, but they used, um, they used brick because it was fashionable. Uh, even the master builders, the, essentially the architects of the time who were involved in the new old court, uh, John Wesley and Robert Grumbold, they were building in red brick elsewhere. Uh, here in St Catharines, again, using Ketton and looking a little bit like Clare, using, using a lot of motifs which are, which are um, familiar in Clare. Um, but uh, still they were using brick and not ashlar, not smooth stone. The one exception to this is Christ's Fellows Building, which um, I think we probably beat them to it as the first use of Ketton ashlar, but only by a few months. And this building went up during the building of the early phases of Clare Old Court, um, the East, East Range. Nobody knows who the master builder or the architect was for this. And there's a suggestion it might have been Grumbold because it, it uh, again, there, there are many shared uh, architectural features with, with Claire. Uh, there's another factor here which I've uncovered and I think might be important. I like to think it is that um, the, and that's looking at the fellow who was in charge of the rebuilding of Clare, a man called Barnabas Oley. He, um, they call him the master of the fabric. He was in charge of building operations. Uh, he was, um, uh, like me, a Yorkshireman and uh, came, from, came from a bit, of it, a bit further north than me from Wakefield. And he was educated at this school, Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in uh, Wakefield. Uh, we used to bus up from Sheffield to play them at football, but they they weren't occupying this building. They're now in a uh, um, uh, in a much more modern building, obviously. But when you look at this building, which Oli was educated in, and bearing in mind that all the blackening on this yellow carboniferous stone uh, is from the Industrial Revolution, when he was there relatively soon after it was built in 1591 it would have been a nice smooth yellow stone and uh, this building has a sort of clairish look about it so uh, I think that Oli uh, wanted um, uh, he, he thought that the proper um, the proper uh, use of, of stone in a in a respectable building was to to use ashlar and not just for the dressings so maybe uh, another question is why did Ketton suddenly become fashionable uh, at this time, uh, as we've seen in Clare, in, in Christ's, and at least in small quantities elsewhere, when it had hardly been used before? It's an extremely good stone, and I don't have a good answer to this. It, it, it's as though it was suddenly discovered, as, uh, and its properties were suddenly realised. It does, um, for instance, have a lovely um, smooth texture. It doesn't show up the bedding planes, the horizontal depositional planes, which many of the Lincolnshire limestones do. Here, here's a stone from Weldon. Here's one from Kingscliff, which uh, are disruptive to the architectural detail. I think if you're trying to, um, certainly if you're if if you're putting up a building with um, in uh, with Renaissance pretensions. Uh, smooth walls are what you want. And the other thing about Ketton stone is if you look under a hand lens at it, it's beautifully even textured. It's made of little spherical grains, a bit less than a millimetre across, called ooids, little snowballs of mud. Uh, 
and comparing it with other available limestones like the Weldon limestone, uh, which has a lot of shell debris in it, it's a much more, um, it's a much smoother stone and therefore much easier to carve without accidents. So it's a, it's a beautiful stone to, to use. It, curiously, um, although uh, there are a lot of buildings in, um, in Ketton village made of this stone, none of them are of great antiquity that I can see. And the church, which is, doesn't use Ketton stone, it uses Barnack stone. So even in Ketton, they hadn't discovered the, the value of their local stone. Well, to bring this story to a, a close, um, Ketton became the most popular stone uh, by volume or by any measure really in Cambridge. I've done a, um, a quantitative survey of stone use in Cambridge, uh, visiting more or less every building with stone in it. And I can tell you that the Lincolnshire limestone uh, belt supplies about two thirds of all stone in Cambridge. And of that uh, Lincolnshire limestone, about a third of that is Ketton. So it's, it's by far the most common stone in Cambridge uh, and justifiably so. Uh, you could pick dozens of buildings which are made of Ketton. Some of the more prominent are Emmanuel, uh, East Range here and there Chapel, uh, concurrent or with the later parts of Clare Old Court. Um, much more grandly, the Red Library in Trinity is Ketton. And then in even greater volumes, the whole of Downing is made of Ketton. Every building right up to more recent ones, or well, actually um, different stones, Portland limestones crept in, in in some of the more modern, modern buildings in part in Downing. And then big structures like St John's New Court. So this is this this accounts for the large volumes. So in summary, um, we've learned that uh, the new Old Court was the first major Cambridge use of Ketton, uh, first high volume use along with Christ's. Uh, and it was the last major use of Collie Western uh, slates, as I say, maybe reusing slates from the old old court. Uh, I think I've worked out what the old old court was made of, of clench walls, which accounts for why it was why it needed replacing. And perhaps the most fascinating and easy to overlook thing is, is the antiquity of these cobblestones. They were they probably were brought onto this site uh, before Clare College existed. Uh, so and date from the old uh, university. Um, hall. Right, uh, that's all I've got to say. I'm glad to um, glad now to take any questions that you've got. Thank you so much, Nigel. That was really an interesting talk. Uh, yes, please do submit your questions into the chat feature, and we will. Uh, I'll I'll ask them to to Nigel. Uh, just one question to begin with: When you showed us the first images of of Old Court and we're talking about the different time periods the stone came from. Uh, how do you go about dating stone like that if you don't know when it was, when the building was put up? Okay, uh, so this is dating their geological age, you mean? Yeah, how, how when I've said they're Jurassic or they're Permian or they're Cretaceous. So uh, it's, um, we, we date the, the, we date, we determine the geological age uh, in the original uh, quarries and outcrops by finding fossils, basically. So um, the the uh, the sequence, the rock sequence, and the and the fossils which are associated with each level in the geological column are well known back from the early 1900s, really. So we have a good knowledge of of what what fossils are found where. So we can we can put them into these named periods. We can actually put a date of millions of years on 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 those those periods using um, radiometric dating techniques, but that's not necessary for what we've been talking about now. Uh, rather more challenging is is trying to uh, link um, the stone in Cambridge back to an original quarry. How do I know that this Ketton 
this is Ketton Stone in Cambridge. Uh, well, I've got pretty good at telling the different stones apart where you can see them. Uh, I go back to the original villages. I, I can wander around Ketton village and look at Ketton stone being used there and match it up exactly with what's in Clare. But um, more, even more um, reliably, some would say, will be the doc using the documentary evidence where it's recorded in old uh, bursary records or whatever as to, to where the stone came from. Uh, it's usually, there are, there are, there are invoices, if you like, or, and uh, receipts for payments made to particular stone merchants for, for stone from a particular source. So we can link, link, link it up that way. And so that the, the full link is made. Is that, is that uh, what you meant, Jan? Yes, yeah, yes, thank you. And are there any buildings in Cambridge that are just an absolute mystery to you? Or generally, is that information available, as you said, from old records or easily found out? There are, there are some, there are some stones which are very um, anonymous, or there, 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 there are limestones which are very similar to each other, and I can't tell apart easily. And sometimes, or quite often, actually, uh, there, are there are stones like Barnack, where the old quarries are no longer uh, in existence, they're, they're completely filled in. So I can't go back to the old quarries and take a chunk of, of, uh, of the original source rock and try and match it up with the building. So um, it, it's, it's a problem. And that's where using uh, stone in the local villages is, is the next best thing, because you assume that came from the local quarries. Uh, so, yeah, I'm mystified sometimes. I should think about, I think about 10% of the stone I see in Cambridge, I just have to put a question mark on, which is, um, which is frustrating, but that's the way it is. We have a question from the audience here about what has inspired you to spend so much time investigating the geology of the colleges in Cambridge? Sorry, well, I missed a crucial word. What is the one? What has inspired you to, to do all of these investigations? Oh, right. It's OK. You might well ask, why am I wasting my time on this? Um, well, I suppose the answer is that ever since I arrived in Cambridge in 1973, I've cycled past these buildings repeatedly. And, and um, as a geologist, I've just looked at them and thought, oh, that's different to that. And what, I wonder where that came from. And I've just built up an interest in, in where these in, uh, stones came from. Um, I haven't allowed myself to, to do a proper uh, academic study with a view to publishing this uh, because it wouldn't in the present climate have, have gained many house points in the, uh, in, in the world in which we live where you have to publish um, uh, scientific papers anyway which, which make uh, a big impact in high profile journals and that's, that's what gets the department um, uh, the right points in the in the recording system for how good the department is. So um, I wouldn't have been very popular with my head of department if I turned to building stones. But I've been retired three and a half years now, so uh, so well nearly four years. So after retirement, I thought, well, if you can't do it now, then when can you do it? So uh, uh, that's one reason. And the second reason, as um, old age uh, and general infirmity brings with it. Um, the, the, a lowered ability to do field work in distant and um, rugged terrains, which I've been doing all my life. Uh, that's where I've collected all my data normally in, in, uh, in Wales and in the Lake District. So I can't do that sort of field work anymore, but I, kill, I, I can still cycle, cycle to a college and uh, park my bike and stagger, stagger around the courts uh, and uh, identify, identify the rock type. So it's a very pleasant way of doing field work uh, without having to uh, travel too far. Of course, actually, I did my quantitative survey um, the summer before uh, the, the pandemic, um, thinking I'll get it done now because, you know, I may be even less fit to get around the colleges next year or the year after that, little realising that um, I wouldn't have been able to get into these colleges. They all shut up completely last summer and are still shut to visitors this summer. It, that study wouldn't have been possible. So that was just very lucky that uh, I got it all done before uh, COVID struck. I hope, I hope that justifies my, my uh, eccentric interest. <laughs> 
No, absolutely. And it's, you know, a pleasure for us to, to hear all about it. So thank you. One other uh, simple question, perhaps, is I noticed on a lot of the images of the stone, there were small black and white tags. Yep. And I was just wondering what those were. Okay, that, that's a scale in centimeters. So that was a, a five centimeter bar. Uh, again, it's just, you know, I'm a scientist. So uh, I, you have to have, you have to have a scale in your images uh, because it's often important what the size of features in the images are. So, so, so I carry around a little, um, a little five centimeter scale, which I stick on the walls with blue tag. Uh, and um, 90% of the time I remember to take it off again, 10% of the time I get to the next building and find that I've left it on, tried to remember where I left it. So um, that's very frustrating, but uh, no, that's, that's, um, uh, uh, that's, what it's, that's what it's there for. Uh, I, in, in the field, geologists tend to use other things like geological hammers, but um, I'm, I, uh, it's very risky. Uh, I wouldn't want to be seen with a geological hammer um, beside a grade one listed building in Cambridge. I'd, I'd get thrown out of colleges pretty quickly. So. Okay, thank you so much, Nigel. I think those are all the questions we have. So thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. It was really very interesting and it's, it's great to have this further insight in, into the, the building that we, some of us go to every day for work and that many of us have spent some lots of time at. So thank you again. And thank you to everyone who attended this evening. We really hope that we can welcome you back to Claire soon. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good night. Thanks very much. Cheerio, everybody.